Well, if you have your Bibles open, you'll likely notice that uh, whoever produced your translation or your edition of your Bible will have put our passage this evening into two sections uh, with two headings. One that looks at the vast crowd that is following Jesus and another section dealing with Jesus choosing his 12 disciples. So arguably there are two separate themes in the passage, which if you were reading a book like, you know, Preaching for Dummies or The Idiot's Guide to Preaching, it would say something like, you know, you ought to really be covering two separate sermons because you have two separate headings in the text. But I think there is a common theme behind these two sections, which I really want to bring out uh, tonight. You see, with the threat of the Pharisees and the Herodians in verse 6, how they were plotting to take the life of Jesus, along with the pressure of a massive crowd with all their great need, verses 9 and 10, all of them getting help from one person. Jesus then responds to that threat on his life and the great needs of the people by selecting these 12 men. These 12 men who will in effect become imitators of his own ministry to spread and expand his ministry further and wider than before. And eventually, after his death, after his resurrection, after his ascension, and then when he sends, him and the Father sends the Holy Spirit, they will then continue Christ's ministry beyond the borders of Israel even, as you read through the Acts of the Apostles, on past chapter 28, until the whole world knows who? Christ. Till the whole world is filled with his glory. Till the whole world knows that Emmanuel has come into our world and, and offers us hope and salvation when we put our trust in him. When we turn from whatever else it is that we believe, and we accept him, we receive him as our Lord and Saviour. So there are two main headings uh, this evening in our study of this passage. In verses 7 to 12, we have a, another summary of Christ's ministry and the obstructions he faced in his ministry. And then verses 13 to 19, uh, they show us the expansion of his ministry in him choosing those 12 disciples. So first of all, we're reminded in verses 7 to 12 of Christ's ministry and the obstructions that he faced in that. We're told there that the Lord Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. Now, why is that? Was he wanting, uh, was he looking for a, like a retreat of sort? Was he needing some form of rest? And so he goes to the seaside to a resting place, as it were. Some commentators believe that is the case. You remember, of obviously, whilst uh, the Lord Jesus was fully God, he was also fully man. He had the same human nature as we do, yet, of course, without sin. But as a true human, as you read through those gospel accounts, he became, for example, tired. Uh, do you remember he slept in a boat? Or he became thirsty when they went to the well of Sychar, Christ was thirsty. Jesus knew himself. He knew that workers in the church need to rest. We'll get to that in chapter 6, verse 31. But I think this withdrawing comes out of the text for these verses. We've already noticed, haven't we, how in the verses prior to this evening's passage, there has been a slow but steady increase in the opposition to the Lord Jesus. Already, uh, and his ministry hasn't been long going, but already we have looked at five disputes that Jesus had with the local religious leaders from the, their sort of unspoken questioning of him forgiving sin in verse 7 of chapter 2 to him then eating with tax collectors and sinners in verse 16. In verse 18, there's a dispute concerning food and fasting. In verse 24, there's a dispute concerning the Sabbath. And then again in chapter 3, verse 4, again, there's a dispute about the Sabbath. So after five disputes, things have become so hot that in verse 6 of chapter 3, we find the Pharisees, 
the separated ones, as they would have called themselves, they are joining forces with really the least likely of associates, the Herodians. We haven't time to look into them much, really, but these were people on the opposite scale of the religious spectrum. It would be a bit like the liberals joining forces with the the evangelicals. That's how corrupt the Pharisees had become, how determined they were to get rid of this man. But they joined forces plotting to kill Jesus. So, so Jesus, knowing that, knowing that the Pharisees would stop at nothing to have him shut down, Jesus withdraws for a while from the towns and the cities and the synagogues to the seaside where his ministry continues. And arguably, his ministry increases. For look at the size of the crowd. This paragraph, verses 7 to 12, really show us two contrasts of obstruction. We see persecution and popularity. Would, would, would popularity be an obstruction to ministry? We'll see in a moment why that might be. But there Mark lists the various places that people had come from to meet Jesus. He says, a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem uh, and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from beyond, from, from, from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd, twice he's used that word now, when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, he came to them. Now, what does that list that Mark gives us, what does that list of places reveal to us of this crowd? Well, it, re it, it reveals the range, uh, the range from where people had travelled. For example, Idumea, uh, the kingdom of Edom, was around 120 miles south of Capernaum. People have also come from the region east of the Jordan and then from the northwest along the coast from around Tyre and Sidon. So, so, the, so the geographical range is very broad from where people have come from, but also the theological range is also broad. There would have been Jews there, obviously Jews, from, from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem. And since Tyre and Sidon was mainly a Gentile area, there could well have been Gentiles amongst the crowd as well. So a, a vast crowd, a diverse crowd, and therefore seemingly we, we would think a great opportunity. But actually, as, as we've noted before, a, a big crowd and popularity is something of a hindrance to Christ's ministry. If you can, try and imagine the scene of this enormous crowd pressing in on Jesus, hundreds of people pushing towards him with, with outstretched arms and hands, desperately trying to touch him. As I thought of that, I had in my mind those images you see of, of funerals where people are desperate to touch the coffin as it's carried on shoulders through the great crowd. It's, it's a massive scene of outstretched arms of people pushing and stretching to touch something. Imagine the noise of, of the place. The noise of desperate voices, of people pleading for help. Imagine the panic, the sense of panic of trampling kicking in. We've seen that fairly recently in Israel where they were commemorating some, I think of some rab, rabbi had died years ago and they were commemorating that and a number of Jews were killed in a stampede. The panic of that happening in this great crowd. There's concern. Even the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned. So much so, he gets a boat ready on standby for his own safety. It's such a desperately sad scene of so many desperately needy people. And Jesus is full of compassion for them, healing many of them, many who were ill of diseases. The Lord, there he is, this one person in a, in a sea of need. But there he is revealing the glory of God. There he is responding compassionately to this desperate situation. But how many of them really realize who he is? 
The whole scene seems to show the crowd more interested in what Jesus can do for them than in what he has to say to them, or even who it really is helping them. All they want is help. Even so, though Jesus is faced with great need, he responds. You think of those scenes in, in Judges where you read of God God punishing the Israelites for having turned away from him. And then when they are in such need that they turn and cry out to him. And God has so much compassion, so much pity for, for people, disobedient people. Still, he is so compassionate, he raises up a judge to lead them back to him and to deliver them from their enemies. And here we have the greatest judge, the Lord Jesus Christ. There he is in the middle of this vast sea of need. One man sent to bring grace, to bring help, to bring salvation. But one man so full of compassion, full of concern, he, he simply gives and gives and gives again of himself and all for the sake of others. So it's, it's a great crowd with great needs and with great ignorance, but not entirely with ignorance. There are others there who do recognize who Jesus is. This is another form of obstruction. They are the, the unclean spirits having taken possession of some of the people there. And Mark describes how these unclean spirits react when they come within sight of Jesus. In verse 11 it says, Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. It's an interesting thought, this, I think. A crowd of, of great need. And seemingly only when the person in need reaches Jesus and comes within range of seeing Jesus, that the real need is revealed. And the person apparently in need appears to others as less enthusiastic about coming so close to Jesus. Why? Because what lies beneath the, the surface need, the seen need, what, what lies beyond, behind that, the unseen real need, is this unclean spirit inhabiting them, slowly destroying them. And it's that that must be dealt with first. But yet again, we are reminded, aren't we, as we were back in chapter 1, verse 24, that within such a vast crowd, it is only the demons, not even the disciples know for sure, really, who this one man is. It's only these unclean spirits who have a correct understanding of who Jesus is. You are the Son of God, they tell him. So why are they saying this? Are they purely being factual? Or, or are they trying something more sinister as an obstruction to the ministry of, of Jesus? Well, according to those who know more about this than, than, than I do, but it's believed that if you knew the name of the Spirit possessing the person you faced, you gain some level of authority, some level of control over it. So as the unclean spirit falls at the feet of Jesus, crying out in despair, the, the spirit is desperately trying to gain mastery over their adversary. And who is he? Who is their adversary? It's the Son of God. So you see how desperate they are. And yet they find themselves in a hopelessly desperate attempt, trying to overcome the impossible. But you see, of everyone there that day, it is these spirits who know who this man is. Here is a man stood with power and authority to heal and the authority to cast them out. And so they are afraid of him. It's such a powerful contrast, these unclean spirits, with the religious leaders of verse 6. There they are, plotting to kill Jesus. And here we have these unclean spirits trembling at the feet of Jesus Christ, knowing who they, who he is. They are trying to master Jesus. 
but he simply commands them to be quiet. He strictly orders them. Apparently in the Greek, that's a very, very strong words that Jesus uses. In other words, his tone is strong with them. Here's a man showing compassion to those with great need, and yet to these unclean spirit, he has a different tone and a different, as it were, facial expression altogether. He is strong towards them. He is commanding towards them. There is no compromise with Jesus. Jesus Christ. These demons must comply. So, so they are powerful. They have overtaken these poor people, these needy people. They could not resist him. They have overcome them. And yet the stronger man, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is more powerful. So Jesus muzzles this obstruction. He silences them. And presumably he casts them out. Even on his own, him, the only one there. Him alone, able to heal, able to cast out demons, but not a single unclean spirit can withstand him. Every one of them knows him. Every one of them trembles and falls before him. What confidence then we can have. What confidence we can have in our great Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. He has been made head over all things, whether seen or unseen. But every obstacle to Christian ministry, the Lord Jesus Christ is able to overcome for his people's sake. So really, what we see here in these verses 7 to 12 are a glimpse of what is happening now. Christ is reaching his people, helping people, bringing to them relief and so forth. But as he casts out these demons, as they fall before him, we see a glimpse of the very end when all obstacles are removed, when Satan and all his demons are silenced, muzzled and cast out into the lake of fire. And all God's people will know that at last their work is over. No more obstacles. All has been done. So, at this point in the ministry, it's exclusively the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is doing the preaching. He alone is doing the teaching, the healing. He alone is casting out demons. In fact, if we, and we will one day, God willing, look at Matthew's version of the gospel, but his version at the end of Matthew chapter 9, he gives us his summary of Christ's ministry. He says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, that's the plural, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What does he then tell his disciples? Not the twelve, because they haven't yet been chosen. But what does he tell his crowd of disciples? He said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And immediately, Matthew records, after Jesus having said that, Jesus does exactly that, what we're looking at next here, as he expands his ministry, verses 13 to 19. And the scene takes us from the seaside in verse 7 to the mountaintop in verse 13, where there Jesus chooses the 12 disciples. Now, hopefully you'll remember Jesus has already chosen four fishermen, uh, uh, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, and a tax collector, Matthew or Levi. But the rest, the rest appear to have been chosen from a much bigger group. For example, in Acts chapter 1, when the group of disciples are replacing Judas Iscariot, the stipulation is, I quote, one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. So there's a group of disciples to be chosen from. And there in Acts chapter 1, they had at least Joseph 
Barsabas and Matthias, who, of course, they choose Matthias. Of course, there's also the women, the great crowd of women who followed the Lord Jesus and out of their own provisions, they, they gave him all that he needed in order to continue the ministry, feeding and so forth, looking after them. So it's from a much wider group of followers that, that Jesus calls to himself those he desires, those who are to be with him and who are to be then sent out from him sent out to preach and have authority to do as he did, to cast out demons. That's what the word apostle means, the sent one. These were disciples from within disciples, but these disciples are particular ones. These are the apostles. So let's look at those two features that Mark tells us about why Jesus chose them. First of all, that they might be with him. Now it's important that we note this first feature, that before Jesus sends them out, and that won't happen until chapter 6 verse 7, but first of all he wants these 12 disciples to be with him. You remember from Acts chapter 4 when Simon Peter and John are stood in front of the council, and there they are speaking boldly of the Lord Jesus, having preached Christ crucified and raised from the dead. The council, they recognized that these were uneducated common men. And yet from what they say, from how they behave, they recognized they had been with Jesus. In other words, they were confidently teaching, proclaiming the same things, the same truth Jesus had taught. And it's that echo of Christ's ministry. They had heard the Lord Jesus teach as well in the temple and so forth. They had heard what Jesus taught and now they hear the echo of that in these men. And that could only happen because these men had been with Jesus. These 12 disciples were those who exclusively got to hear the explanation of what Jesus taught the crowd in parables. We'll look at that in chapter 4, verse 11. These 12 exclusively spent three years or so with Jesus, uh, listening to him respond to the opposition he faced. They, they watched how he reacted in, in various situations, whether publicly or for them exclusively in private. What was Jesus like in private? They saw all of it, and we see glimpses of that in the Gospels. But wherever Jesus went, wherever he ministered, they would be with him, observing him, listening to him, learning from him, sharing in the work that he entrusted to them, he gave them to do, tasting the opposition. We'll get to that point where Jesus sends them out and he, he tells them what to do when people reject them, when they go into the towns and villages and so forth. But, but Jesus modeled for them what kingdom ministry looks like. He modeled for them how he wanted them to be themselves in their ministry. But then there's also a sense of fellowship that Jesus wanted with these 12 people. He wanted to be with them as friends, as companions. Remember, that was part of the tragedy in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when Judas approaches Jesus and betrays his friend with a kiss. Of all his followers, Jesus wanted these 12 to be his closest friends, of which, of course, Peter, James, and John would become the very closest. They were the inner circle of the 12 disciples. Now, obviously, in the history of our church, general, you know, the, the church, these 12 are, are unique. They are the 12 as they're referred to. Judas was always referred to Judas, one of the 12. These are exclusive people. These are rare people. These are the apostles of the church whose apostolic teaching, their scriptures, have become the foundation of who we are, what we are as a church. So, they are exclusive to us, and yet, yet the principle is the same for all who would serve Jesus. And that is to first be with the Lord Jesus. 
In other words, there is a very important correlation between your usefulness to Jesus and how close you are with him. How much time you spend with him, studying him in the scriptures, really getting to know him. Getting to know him in order to imitate him. Getting to understand his example in order for you to imitate him. To live out his pattern, his life as a model for your own life. In life and in ministry. But also, and arguably more important, but how much time you spend with him in prayer how much time you really give to being with the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Because history and experience proves that that those who talk with Jesus the most have the most to say about Jesus to others. However that looks, whether in prayer or in preaching or in conversation or in teaching. But those who are with Jesus the most, tend to be the most useful to Jesus in his expanding ministry. In Matthew 28 verse 20, as he commissions them to go out into the whole world to make disciples and so forth, Jesus promises his disciples that he would be with them. And that is always a great promise for us to remember as we minister in God's kingdom, that the Lord Jesus Christ is with us. But first, they and we must be with him. He will be with us as we minister, but we must first be with him. Otherwise, we're just promoting religion and morals and and trying better and do harder, which is none of that is the good news of God's grace in Jesus Christ. So be with Jesus. Secondly, of course, Jesus chose them to send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. In other words, he's expanding his ministry through them, a 12-fold expansion. They were sent ones. They were the apostles. They weren't to preach what they thought. They weren't to preach what they felt about things. Remember, one of them was called Simon the Canaanian or or Simon the Zealot. Here was a, 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 a nationalistic sort of bloke. Here was someone, his pet hobby would have been national issues in the life of Israel. And that could have been his big thing that he always brought his message back to, preaching about how Israel and so forth and so forth. No, these th- these 12 men were sent to preach the message of Jesus Christ. They, they were to project his message. They were to repeat his message and project his message further and further by taking his message out from him to the surrounding villages and towns. And preaching and using his authority, they would do as he did and command demons to leave people. Apparently Judaism believed that the restraining of demons would characterize the messianic age. So what Jesus began by himself back there in chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 That will now, through these 12, be replicated and be expanded to to sweep across the whole of Israel with this message that the Messiah has now come. And therefore, what is the response? What should people now do but repent and believe in the gospel? And again, whilst these 12 are unique, they are never to be repeated. The principle here is the same for expanding every local church ministry. If the only person ministering God's word is the one person, the pastor or the minister or the vicar or whoever you want to call him, but if that is the only person ministering God's word, then the ministry will inevitably become bottlenecked. It'll become limited, a one-man ministry. But if the leadership of every local church does what they're there for, as Paul explains, then then every church would have every member ministry. 
where in some way every member is actively ministering God's word. To do as these 12 would do, to spread further God's kingdom. And in effect, yes, in doing that, destroying the kingdom of the devil. Paul writes in Ephesians 4 verse 11, These are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And that's the goal of the church officers here at Welbeck Road Church. In the materials we use, for example, in, in, in our home groups, the, the series we choose for Sundays or for Tuesdays, or with the discipleship groups we run, but, but we're aiming we're aiming to reproduce more and more ministers of God's word. That, that every member of Welbeck Road Church would, would feel competent, competent enough, and by God's grace, confident enough to use the gifts God has given them. Whether that is in public or in private, regardless, but that every one of us who professes faith in Jesus Christ, who, who comes to Welbeck Road, who sees this as their local family, their church family. But every one of us would be actively serving the Lord and one another in the ministry here at Welbeck Road Church. So then, having given us these two features of Christ calling and appointing the twelve disciples, Mark then, as you'll see, lists the 12 for us. And notice it's 12, it's, it's not 10, it's not 7, it's not 14, like multiples of 10 and 7. But it's 12, which is clearly a reference to the 12 tribes of Israel. And passages like Matthew 19, verse 28, or Luke 22, verse 30, if you read those passages, they will make that covenant link with the 12 disciples even clearer. We haven't time tonight to look at each of the 12 names that Jesus chose. John MacArthur's written a great book on the 12 disciples. I would thoroughly encourage you to read that. But as we close, let's just mention a couple of principles from this list. First of all, do you notice how diverse the group is? Uh, we have fishermen, we have Simon, Andrew, James and John. We have a tax collector, or rather an ex-tax collector, Matthew. There's also Simon, the zealot, a nationalist, who would, who would naturally be passionately opposed to someone like Matthew. To Simon, the zealot, Matthew would be a traitor. And yet Jesus chooses these these opposite ends of the spectrum, these men brings them together and brings them into his, his exclusive team of 12 disciples. Even the personalities of the men suggest diversity. Uh, we have Simon, the passionate, headstrong sort of man. We have James and John, nicknamed Sons of Thunder. And if you remember that scene in Luke 9 where they wanted to bring down fire on a certain time because they didn't respond well to Jesus passing through. That's the kind of men that were in uh, this group of disciples. And then we have Thomas. Thomas, who usually in the Gospels appears to be more reserved, more doubtful than the others. So clearly from a, a naturally, a human perspective, there's arguably more that would divide these 12 men than unite them. And yet Jesus holds them together. He, he's like a glue. He holds them together. All of them are unique. All of them are individual, yet the person of Jesus and, and his abilities, his leadership abilities, his discipling of them, and of course his great love for each of them, he keeps them together. And as we read John 15, he prays that, doesn't he, in his great high priestly prayer. Those you have given to me, I have kept every one of them, except one of them. And of course, uh, that's Judas, the one who in all 
four Gospels where these 12 names are listed. It's like a ball and chain around his foot. Judas, who would betray him. Jesus kept all of them together except Judas. So we have a diverse group, yet Jesus holds them. In other words, it's not the personality of the person. It's not even their politics, not even their background, but it's the heart of the person. Judas did not have a heart like the others. It's the heart of the person that matters, a, a, a regenerated, a converted heart. And the Lord Jesus and his word will bind such hearts together to, to form a working party, a group, a local group of believers who will stand side by side, yes, with all their diversity, with all their differences, which they must set aside and focus on the person of Jesus Christ, but he will keep them together, hold them together. He's the glue that brings us together for us to serve him and make his name known. And then secondly and finally, what do we really know of these 12 men, really? Apart from the big names, you know, like Simon and James and John and even Judas, you know, most of these men aren't actually explicitly mentioned again after this. We're really reliant upon legend, upon church tradition rather than true historical fact. And yet Jesus chose them. And it's through these men that Christ established his church. It's these 11, because Judas left, of course, 11 plus Matthias, we read in Acts chapter 1. These 12 men who, who went out into the world, enabled by the Holy Spirit. Some went westward, some went eastward, but they went out and replicated the ministry of their Saviour and Lord Jesus Christ. Preaching and teaching what Jesus has, had taught them. And in his name, as his apostles, they, they did what apostles did. They, they performed signs and wonders. They, they showed the authenticity of what they were saying by what they did in the name of Jesus Christ. They, they preached, they demonstrated, and of course they suffered just as their master had also suffered. But they are largely unknown. They are. So very, very little is known of these men. Yet our existence today and is due in large part to such people, to them and to the long string of such nameless people, but faithful men and women who in their generation ministered God's word and expanded his kingdom. Nameless people, most of them unknown, some of them are known. You read their books, maybe you have them on your shelf. But, but by and large, 99% of them are unknown. But we thank God for them. We thank God for those who came before us, who expanded the kingdom of God, who, who, who replicated the ministry of Jesus Christ and went further with the same message to tell people about him. We thank God for them. And I hope that those who come after us will thank God for us. If we, if you and I, if we in this generation, our generation, are, are, are faithful, faithful to the calling, faithful to the gifting that God has given us, but we do as those disciples were chosen to do way back then, to replicate the ministry of Jesus and take it further, take it out further, take it beyond our little boundary, our little part of the world, but take it a bit further and to see his name known further and further afield, but to keep expanding this glorious kingdom, a kingdom which of course ultimately Christ himself is expanding, but he does it through us, through us and through the tremendous enabling power 
of the Holy Spirit. May we give ourselves afresh then to him, to our master, to the head of our church, that he may use us more and more till the church is built and the earth is filled with Christ's glory. Amen.